With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer to the Hebrews is continuing to exhort weary believers to run the race with endurance. In the 11th chapter, he chronicled for us a great cloud of witnesses, faith's hall of fame, people who would testify indeed that there is none better, none higher, none greater than the Lord Jesus. And as we look unto Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, and commit to run the race of life with endurance, he opens chapter 12 by telling us that we need to lay aside every weight, every encumbrance, and the sins that so easily beset the people of God. In our last lesson, he dealt with the issue of holiness and told us that we need to pursue holiness because without it, no one shall see the Lord. Now, after dealing with holiness, he turns to the issue of bitterness and places it on the bottom shelf so that the youngest child can understand it. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of Bitterness springing up caused trouble, and by this many become defiled. I personally and pastorally don't know any emotion, any mindset, any condition of the soul that is more destructive, damaging, even deadly than the fatal sin of bitterness. Webster's Dictionary calls it anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. God in His Word calls it sin. And I submit it is a sin that, yes, easily besets even the people of God. In fact, if you don't know already someone in your life that at least you perceive has done you wrong, perhaps they have offended you, mistreated you, violated you in some way. If If you don't know anything about that, I hope you get what you want for your fifth birthday. But considering most of our preschoolers are in the preschool service this morning, for the rest of us, let's be honest. The tendency to hold a grudge, harbor a hurt, to be unforgiving, it's a sin that vexes every father's child. You want to run the Christian race? Not be hindered and entangled by the sins of this world? The writer says, there is a vine that will entangle you and it has sprung up from the root of bitterness. And rather than clinging to it, protecting it, holding on to it, and defending it and justifying it, the writer says to dig it up. Now, if we are to be freed today from the burden of bitterness, there are three things I think this verse would say to us. Number one, I want to breathe a word about the root that must be examined. Here, bitterness is compared to a root down in the soil that is going to spring up and yield a bitter fruit. Just like verse 14 told us, There's something we had to long for, namely longing for and pursuing holiness. Here is something not to long for, but to look for. Look for it. Watch for it. See to it. Look carefully. That no root of bitterness springs up in your life. Now the command here to search it out or to look for it is instructive in and of itself. See to it or looking carefully First of all, is a personal command. It's written with the implied subject of you. No one is left out of this command. You are to look carefully for bitterness and unforgiveness in your life. It's a personal command. It's also a plural command. The language here in the original text is plural. If the writer was writing to South Hebrews, (laughs) he'd say, y'all look carefully. The implication here is not only we have a responsibility to examine our own lives, we have a commitment from God to help our brothers and our sisters examine their lives for the root of bitterness too. And interestingly enough, not only is this command personal and 
plural, it's pastoral. The Greek word is actually a derivative of the word episkopos, episcope. Elsewhere in the New Testament, it is used to describe the pastor, the shepherd, the bishop, the overseer. It literally means to look out over something. And because it's written in the plural, because it's written in the pastoral, that means that personally every one of us has an obligation, a command from God to not only examine our own lives for bitterness, but to assist one another to see if a root of bitterness may be springing up to cause trouble and ultimate defilement. R. Kent Hughes, the great Presbyterian commentator, notes here that this personal plural pastoral word means that we are called, I like this, to some sanctified meddling in each other's lives. That we must consciously involve ourselves in the body of Christ, assuming responsibility for others, for seeing others go on in grace, and also humbly receiving their care for us. Now, why would we need this corporate collective church-wide commitment to examine our lives for the root of bitterness. I think there are three reasons just very practically. First, bitterness is concealed. The writer intentionally uses this horticultural analogy and says that, that bitterness is not on the front page. Bitterness is not primarily stamped on your forehead. It's not on a billboard. No, it's a root buried down in the soil of the human heart. Now, where does it come from? In previous messages, I've told you that bitterness is really caused by one of three things. You could take anything that has hurt you and put it into one of these three categories. A statement spoken, a thing taken, a deed done. A statement spoken, a thing taken, A deed done. Somebody said something. Somebody did something. Somebody took something. Or it could be something they did not say you thought they should have. They did not do, you're convinced they ought to have done. (laughs) Or they didn't give something or didn't take something and you thought that they should have. And that seed from the hurtful past has become buried deep in the soil of the human heart. In most plants, the root itself is invisible to the human eye, but it is nonetheless real. Buried deep in the soil, but it's not far from the surface. Because it is concealed, that means at least for a while, you can look good on the outside. You can cover it up, dress it up with a, with a suit and a tie, your nicest polo shirt, your uniform or your outfit to go to work or to class, you can for a while hide it behind stained glass vocal cords and external religious behavior. Bitterness can hide and it hides so well that oftentimes bitterness can be seen first by those around us. I'm answering the question, why do we need help from one another? Because the bitter person is often the last one to recognize it. Like broccoli stuck in your teeth or toilet paper hanging to your shoe coming out of a public bathroom. Or maybe bad breath when you need somebody to hand you a mint and say, here, please don't save it. We need people in our lives that will lovingly Graciously, biblically, say, brother or sister, I'm not your judge, but I I can't help but feel that I detect something here in your life that you need to prayerfully look at and look for. We need one another's help because it's concealed, but also because it is camouflaged. And by that I mean even when you see it, it will pretend to be something else. It will disguise itself, mask itself. It will camouflage itself. I don't know any sin in my life like bitterness that camouflages itself so well. And by that, I don't mean merely that it hides 
But when you finally discover it, it pretends to be something that it's not, including something that is right, godly, biblical, spiritual. When I was in undergraduate school, we came in one afternoon and most of the computers in our department had been stolen earlier that day. They were stolen in broad daylight. Because two guys pulled up to the front door and somehow they had acquired or maybe fabricated some shirts that looked like they were from the IT department of the institution. This was before updates were all in the cloud. They had to take all of those computers over to the IT department and download the newest version of whatever. Nobody even knew what had happened until they never came back. (laughs) They'd walked in the front door pretending to be someone they were not and robbed the department blind. Do you know bitterness does that? Even when you see it, it has on another shirt and another name badge like a spiritual chameleon. It changes its appearance. Primarily with God's people, it changes its external appearance into something godly. I'm not bitter, by the way. Those are the first, those are typically the first words out of a bitter person's mouth. I'm not bitter. I'm righteously angry. There is such a thing as righteous indignation. Yes, there is, but most likely you don't have it. I'm not bitter, I've got a desire for justice. They've done wrong, and the Bible says that that wrong should be punished. Right, but just not by you, and not by me. And like most acts of the devil, if not all acts of the devil, there will be Bible verses attached to the disguise. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Lord, I know vengeance is yours, and here I am. I just want to be a vessel, a tool for your honor. Use me, Lord, in your campaign of vengeance in their life. Preacher, you know the Bible says, be angry and sin not. There's such a thing as a non-sinful anger. Yeah, but it usually doesn't make the veins pop out on your neck. You say, I know my heart. Listen carefully. No, you don't. And neither do I. The Bible says that our heart is scheming and deceptive and wicked. Nobody's ever lied to you as much as you've lied to you. So in this examination for the root of bitterness, we'd be well advised to pray the prayer of David in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be a wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I will tell you this. The devil has no interest in putting his finger on bitterness in your heart. And and, and calling you to deal with it. So whatever or whoever it is that's on your heart right now. I submit that's the Holy Spirit. As we examine this root, it's concealed, it's camouflaged, and thirdly, it's corrupt. It's not a root of happiness, it's not a root of gratitude, it is a root of bitterness. And bitterness is not a personality trait. It's a spiritual disease. It's not a relational issue between you and that person. It's a spiritual issue ultimately between you and God. When someone offends me and I get sinfully angry, which is most of my anger, is sinful anger. It starts out on the horizontal realm. But if I don't deal with it, it gets vertical in a hurry. and begins to hinder my walk with the Lord Jesus. It's not an attitude, it's a sin. It's not because you're the red-headed descendant of Irish blood. It's because we are the black-hearted descendants of Adam's blood. 
In Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 30, the Bible says there are some things that we can do that grieve the Spirit of God, that make God grieved with our behavior. And the list does not start with what we would commonly call the great sins of the culture. The list begins with bitterness, and we are commanded by the Lord to remove it from our midst. It's corrupt. Some in this room are bitter toward God. Now, being angry with God, shaking your fist at heaven, makes as much sense as yelling at Stone Mountain and think you're going to make it go away. But it could be some death, disease, divorce, some difficulty in your life. And you've blamed God ever since. Some are bitter toward a friend. More accurately, a former friend. A boss that unjustly fired you. A friend that betrayed you. They, they told you that they were your buddy. They said they were your confidant. That's until stabbing you in the back profited them. The colleague that lied to you. The business partner who would have ruined the company if it were not for what you did when he left you holding the bag. Some are bitter toward a dad who never spent time with you, a mother who left your father and your siblings for another man. In this room, I'm just saying this based on the size of this congregation, there's bitterness toward an ex-husband or an ex-wife, a child whose rebellion hurt your family, a parent whose dysfunction hurt you, a sibling who robbed you blind when mama died. I mean, it was only a used trailer on a quarter acre of rented land. But it put something down in your soul that you haven't gotten over yet. And many of God's children are bitter toward a pastor. Some church leader or minister who let you down, they hurt your feelings or wounded you in some way. And here the Bible teaches us that we need to recognize it for what it is. There's a root that must be examined. Now, in my yard, I have never intentionally sprayed Roundup or any other weed killer on any plant until I first realized three things. One, that it was a weed that I didn't want. Two, I recognized that that its root went way down deep and just reaching over and picking it up, or pulling it out, was not going to solve the problem. I had to know it was a weed, I had to know that it had a deep root, and I had to acknowledge it's going to do damage if I leave it alone. And the root of bitterness must be examined. But secondly from this verse, not only we see the root that must be examined, but the ruin that should be expected. The writer says the reason we need to deal with it while it's a root It's because if you don't dig up the root, the tree's going to come up. And if you don't deal with it then, there are going to be blossoms on the tree. If you don't deal with the blossoms, there's going to be fruit on that tree. And if you don't deal with the fruit on the tree, the the fruit's going to fall to the ground. And guess what's in that fruit? Seeds. To create more and more and more and more bitterness. And this verse tells us you can expect spiritual, mental, psychological, even physical ruin if we don't deal with the root of bitterness. Adrian Rogers once said that a bitter person is like a porcupine. They may have several really good points, but you can't stand to be near them. (laughs) Richard Phillips in his commentary says that bitterness defiles and stains When it spreads, and the emphasis here is that it it always spreads. You've got two options. Let it spread or dig it up. In Georgia, you might understand it as bitterness being the kudzu of the soul. And God warned Israel about this bitter root. Teaching them primarily about idolatry and false doctrine. God warns about Thinking you can escape the root of bitterness. You say, not me, preacher. God said to Israel in Deuteronomy 29, verse 18 and following, Be sure there is no root among you 
bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. Do you see the connection here? When someone hears the words of this oath, could I say, when somebody hears this sermon today and considers himself exempt and says, I'm going to have peace in my heart even though I'm following my own stubborn heart. God said to Israel, the writer said to the Hebrews, and I say to you, that if you allow a poisonous, bitter root to stay planted in your heart, you can think, I'm the exception. It's not going to bother me. I'm going to go my own stubborn way and still have peace in my heart. God simply says, no, you won't. There's a ruin that should be expected. Now this word bitterness gives us our word for poison. And I want to show you some effects, some ruinous effects of bitterness. And if these things are true in your life, there's good news. You can call God's poison control today. And he'll come spray some heavenly roundup on the thing and kill it all the way down to the tap root. Well, what ruin should I... Expect, number one, it will saturate your mind. If you've traveled through the North Georgia region, you know exactly what I meant a moment ago when I said that bitterness is the kudzu of the soul. That is, as it grows and springs up to trouble you, it will take up more and more and more of the soil of your heart, or you might say the soil of your mind. You find yourself thinking about that situation all the time. It consumes more and more of your thoughts. And more and more things in your life can be quickly connected to that one thing. It's always right below the surface, right on the tip of your tongue. And it doesn't take much for you to gripe about that. You'll gripe about it at the drop of a hat and bring the hat and drop it if need be. Because it's saturating the mind. A medical doctor wrote a book years ago called None of These Diseases. A Christian medical doctor having researched the physical and psychological consequences of spiritual issues like hatred, envy, and bitterness. In that book, Dr. S.I. McMillan writes about these destructive emotions and he says, the moment I start hating a man, I become his slave. I can't enjoy my work anymore because he even controls my thoughts. My resentments produce too many stress hormones in my body and I become fatigued after only a few hours of work. The man I hate, he writes, hounds me wherever I go. I can't escape his tyrannical grasp on my mind. The man I hate may be many miles from my bedroom, but more cruelly than any slave driver, he whips my thoughts into such a frenzy that my inner spring mattress becomes a rack of torture. The lowliest of servants can sleep, but not I. I really must acknowledge, he writes, the fact that I'm a slave to every man on whom I pour the vial of my wrath. When I talk to and counsel people who are dealing with bitterness and when I deal with its sin in my own heart, One of the commonalities is, after all they've done to me, they've just gone on with their life like nothing's wrong. I'm the one that's been hurt and they've moved on. He left me and these children, now he's remarried and move on. She walked out on me and now has a brand new life and I'm here in the shattered ruins of an old tattered life. Preacher, they've moved on. I don't mean to heap hurt on that fact this morning, but I would just encourage you, if they have moved on, maybe by God's grace it's time for you to move on too. And not allow someone who has done you so wrong to go on vacation with you. I don't mean to be too picturesque, but they'll... They'll be in the shower with you getting ready in the morning. They're in the bed when you go to lay down at night. They, they get in the car with you. They're at work with you. You go out to that most remote deer stand thinking you're going to drop a trophy buck and you turn around. It's a one-seat climber, but it turns out to be a buddy stand because they're up there with you. Saturating the mind. 
In fact, on this subject, back in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul said that if we don't deal with this ungodly anger, we will give the devil a place. Don't give place to the devil. That word means a foothold. Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give him an opportunity. It's a military term that means a beachhead. Don't give the devil a place of operation to do war against God's will for your life. That word in Ephesians 4, giving the devil a place, is also a legal term that speaks of having given him a right to be where he is. In other words, you rush to an altar of prayer and you say, God, get that devil off my back, out of my life, and out of the bedroom of my heart, and you don't realize your bitterness signed a lease agreement. He's got the right to be there. Until through a transaction of forgiveness, you let the grace of God break the lease and kick him out. Bitterness will saturate your mind. Secondly, bitterness will sicken your body. Here the writer simply says this bitter root will spring up and cause trouble. And some of that trouble will happen in the mind and some of it will happen in the body. Someone has said that bitterness is a tumor that eats you from the inside out. Someone else said that bitterness is an acid that destroys its own container. One of my favorite quotes says that harboring bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Imagine being mad at somebody, sir, so you go out to your tool shed and you get a bottle of concentrated Roundup mix. You turn it up and you drain it dry. Look at the person that angered you and you say, there, take that. Only a fool would do such a thing. That's why bitterness is foolish. Cormac McCarthy in the book Cities of the Plain writes, The man who has done you injury or injustice makes himself an unwanted guest in your house forever and only forgiveness can dislodge him. Bitterness will saturate the mind and sicken the body and when when bitterness stays in your heart, it shows up in your flesh. Dr. Macmillan, who I referenced earlier, Notes as many as 50 physical diseases that he thinks are primarily caused by spiritual factors. Things like heart disease, high blood pressure, gastrointestinal problems, and the most gracious way to say it is marital dysfunction. Bitterness shows up in the body. Now to be clear, I don't believe that every sick person is bitter. But sooner or later, every bitter person will be sick. It could be that what you need today is not a pharmacy but an altar. It could be that what your physical malady needs is not a prescription but but an altar of repentance where you say, God, would you forgive them for what they've done to me and God, would you forgive me for harboring the sin of bitterness. Proverbs 14.30 says, A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body, but envy is like cancer in the bones. You say, preacher, can a Christian be bitter? Yes. Can someone with bitterness go to heaven? Yes. You might get there a long time before you otherwise would have had to go. Because bitterness will saturate the mind. It will sicken the body. But as it springs up and causes trouble, it will also sour your spirit. You've heard that birds of a feather flock together. Well, if we're honest, nobody really wants to be around a bitter person except other bitter people. The bitter person hurts no one more than they hurt themselves, but they hurt more than themselves. You see, bitterness impacts every relationship in the life. Look right here and watch this. Bitterness is not just something between me and that other person. Bitterness is something in my heart. And therefore, it's not that I have bitterness as much as it is that I am bitter. It's not something I possess as much as it is who I am. 
And if you hold on to the possession of bitterness long enough, you will be a bitter person. That means you'll be a bitter boss, a bitter employee, a bitter mom, a bitter dad, a bitter son, a bitter daughter, a bitter classmate, a bitter teammate. It will impact and infect every aspect of your life because it will sour your spirit. Jesus spoke of the importance of this issue. After giving his model prayer, we call the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6, beginning in verse 14, the Lord said, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, that's what we're talking about today. If if you say, I'm not going to forgive, then guess what? Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Previously preaching on this subject, I told you that I know some Christians, some churches, some homes, some families that would be blessed by a good case of spiritual amnesia. God, by your grace, will you help me move on from the past? Because there's a root that must be examined. There is a ruin that should be expected. Count on it. Take it to the bank. Write it down. It's coming. But there's good news even in this text, as we see thirdly and finally, the remedy that can be experienced. I've got good news of grace today. It's not terminal. At least it doesn't have to be. (laughs) There's biblical chemo. There's a biblical cure. There's spiritual surgery to dig up the root of bitterness. Now, bitterness can be difficult to remove. But listen, friend, it's not impossible to remove. It may be impossible for you. You say, I... Cannot. But things that are impossible with men are possible, hallelujah, are possible with God. Well, what is that remedy? Well, there are three things pastorally I just want to lay on your heart today. Number one, remember God's grace. I'm taking this admonition from the text He warns us, looking carefully. And here's the first part of the problem. Lest anyone fall short of what? The grace of God. That word fall short means to be in want, to be in lack, to not have enough. It's the same word that Jesus used in Luke 15. You remember the parable of the prodigal son? Spends all his money, finds himself in the prodigal pig pen is even willing to eat the husk that the swine did eat, but no man gave to him, and he began to be in want. That's this same word. And the writer to the Hebrews says, you better make sure that you don't find yourself coming up short, lacking, or being in want of the grace of God. That someone needs God's grace from you. And you and I who have received so much grace say, I don't have any I'm going to give you. The Bible says you better see to it that you don't come up short in the distribution of grace. The enduring word commentary notes that this phrase, fall short of the grace of God, might also be translated failing to keep up with the grace of God. The idea is that grace... God's grace is moving on past the pain and the hurt of the past. We should move on also. You remember here, all of this is about running the Christian race. Running with endurance. And the Bible says you better be sure that you don't let the grace of God outpace you on this race and get ahead of you. When the grace of God moves on, you better keep up with it. And as it moves on past the past and past the hurt and past the wrong, you and I would better be sure that we don't let it outpace us. Again, so that we who have received so much of God's grace don't tell those who have wronged us that we have no grace to give. This is the subject of our Lord's parable in Matthew 18. Jesus concludes that parable by saying, You wicked servant. I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. 
Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? You remember that parable? A servant came to his master. It was an employee that came to the boss. And he owed a huge debt. A debt he couldn't repay in a thousand lifetimes. And moved with compassion, the master forgave him. Then that servant, having been forgiven of so much, went out and found a fellow slave, a co-worker, who owed him a few bucks. And he grabbed him by the throat and threatened to beat him and have him thrown into the debtor's prison. And when word got back to the master, and by the way, when we know the master is God, it doesn't take long for the word to get back. That after all I forgave you of, says the Lord. You won't forgive that person who did that to you. I do not mean to make light of your suffering. And I don't like it when people make light of mine. But I will tell you this. The least thing I have done against My God, my smallest sin is infinitely and eternally greater than if my worst enemy had a million lifetimes to wrong me every single day. For I have sinned against a God who is pure, holy, blameless, righteous, perfect, and undefiled. And when you sin against an infinite and eternal God, there are infinite and eternal consequences against it. So the Apostle Paul writing to the Ephesians tells them and us that we're to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. On the back of the door in my study, I have a sign I printed on my computer. It just has a question. Where's the cross? Where is the cross? It's a reminder to me that my sermon isn't finished until I've made sure that, that I get you to Calvary. And we cannot talk about forgiveness without me asking you, have you looked to Calvary lately? Unconverted, unsaved sinner, have you looked to Calvary lately? There is a God in human flesh hanging there, becoming your sin, that He may offer you forgiveness for anything and everything that you have ever done. Would you receive His grace today? And for those of us who have been recipients of that divine gift of mercy, let us see Him fresh and new today, hanging there as a substitute and a sacrifice For our sin. And right before he dies, one of his final statements Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Paul says we should use that as the yardstick by which we forgive those who have wronged us. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, once said, Let us go to Calvary and learn how we can be forgiven. By the way, isn't it great to know you can go to Calvary and learn you can be forgiven? He said, let us go to Calvary and learn how we can be forgiven. Let us linger there. That we may learn how to forgive. Remember God's grace. Secondly, request God's goodness. By that I simply mean to pray for them. Ask for God's blessings on their life. It's hard to hate somebody that you're praying for at the same time. You say, well, they're lost in their sin. Well, that's all the more reason to pray for them. That they would come to know Christ and the forgiveness of sin. You say, well, preacher... I can't pray for them because I don't want God's goodness in their life. That's why you need to pray for God's goodness in your life so that your heart will be clean before the Lord. 
And by praying for them, I do not mean to pray, Lord, would you bless them and keep them and help them never be as ugly again to anybody else as they were to me. That old vicious, good-for-nothing, sorry, low-down, dirty dog. Help him never be like that again, Lord. I mean that you sincerely pray that God would bless them. I don't want to be the hero of my own sermon and I certainly have no right to be. But as a fellow pilgrim, I can tell you one of the greatest tools of sanctification God has used in my life is to pray for some men who will never know of my prayers and to ask God to protect them. To preserve their reputation for the sake of the gospel. And that they would know nothing but the blessing and the favor of God. Remember God's grace, friends. We've been forgiven of much. Request God's goodness. Pray for God to pour out blessings upon their life. Thirdly and quickly, we should reflect God's gospel. Reflect God's gospel. Ask yourself and ask the Lord to help you. That your response to those who have wronged you would be a picture, yes, of a love that will not let me go. And Lord, as others watch me deal with that person and watch them respond to me, may it in some small but powerful way picture the mercy of a God who before the foundation of the world saw me in need of a Savior. And came into this world, listen to me now, listen, 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 that that did not die for his friends. But he laid down his life for his enemies. God, may the way that I respond to those that have wronged me make much of Christ. You've heard perhaps the name Corey Ten Boom. She was a survivor of one of the Nazi concentration camps, a devoted and devout Christian. Corey Ten Boone, her family, would hide some of their fellow Jews inside the house in some of the cavities and hidden places in their home. And her story is chronicled in a book called The Hiding Place. And I would commend that book to you. Corey Ten Boom tells the story. Immediately after World War II, she would go around and tell her testimony. This particular event happened in 1947. If you know your history, that's basically still in the wake of World War II, and we were still, as a people, discovering things about the horrors of the Holocaust. And Corey Ten Boom would go around and share her testimony, and she said that nobody ever came up to her for questions because the the, the passion in that time in history was still so powerful. She would share the story of how her mother and her father and her sister Betsy were killed by the Nazis, and she alone escaped to represent her family. And people would get up at the end of the presentation just quietly file out without a word. So one evening in 1947, what caught her attention was a man making his way against the crowd. Everyone was quietly leaving as they always did, but this one man was making his way toward her. And she immediately, from the horrors of war, recognized him as one of the guards from where she had been in a place called Ravensbrook. In her book, she chronicles this story. It's a lengthy quote, but I think it's profitable. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he said. I was a guard there, she writes. That's when I realized he did not remember me. But testifying of his coming to faith in Christ, he said, I now know God has forgiven me of the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Oh, dear Fraulein, again... His hand extended to me. Will you forgive me? I stood there, she writes, and I could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death? 
simply by asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there hand held out, but it seemed hours to me as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I would ever have to do, for I had to do it. I knew that. But still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand to His. I can do that much, but you, Lord, must supply the feeling. And so woodenly, even mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one outstretched to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. A current seemed to start in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then a warmth seemed to flood over my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. And I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even so, I realized it was not my love. For I had tried and did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. As recorded in Romans 5, 5. Where Paul said that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which He has given to us. And my admonition to you today is that we would pray for those who have wronged us. Ask God to bless those who despitefully use us. And pray that our response would make much of Jesus. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit pastormikestone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emmanuel Pulpit.